Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see lots of activity going on in the chat. It looks like we have lots of classes tuning in from across the country. So I know people will be joining over the course of the next few minutes, but we have an action packed agenda. So uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. So Welcome everybody to ACE's third annual Earth Week Climate Teach-In. I am Reb Anderson and I am ACE's Director of Education and uh, I will be your host today for this one hour program. We are thrilled to have you all with us today. Uh, as of last count, we had over 150 people signed up from over 30 states across the country. I know that many of you watching today are teachers who are watching with your classrooms. Um, so we are thrilled to have so many students and teachers joining us today to talk climate change and climate solutions. I also want to give a shout out to everyone who's tuning in right now on Facebook Live. We're excited to have you all with us too. So before we get started, I just want to direct your attention to the chat box. It looks like lots of you are using it already, but this is where you can type in your comments, ask questions of our guests, and most importantly, answer the trivia questions that we are going to have for you. So I'd love for everyone who hasn't done so already to test out the chat box by typing in your school name and where you're from and how many students you're watching with so we can see uh, the range of locations that we have represented here today. So go ahead and do that and we'll see everyone who's joining. If you are tuning in solo, you can just type in your first name and location. And then teachers, if you also want to pull out your phones real quick and take a quick selfie of you and your class tuning into our program today and email it to me at reb at aspace.org, uh, you can win a $50 American Express gift card. So go ahead and do that too. We'd love to get some pictures of you all watching with us today. Okay, so I think okay, you so are familiar with ACE and what we do. We are the Alliance for Climate Education, and our mission is to educate young people on the science of climate change and empower them to take action. Since 2008, we have educated two and a half million young people about climate change and trained over 4,000 young people to become climate leaders. ACE really works to connect climate change to issues of justice and equity through our programs and the young people that we work with. Um, and for those of you who are just joining us now, both on Zoom and on Facebook Live, welcome. I'm Reb Anderson, and this is ACE's third annual Earth Week Climate Teach-In. Okay, so what are we going to be doing for the next hour? First, I'm going to introduce you all to our three special guests. Then we're gonna take a brief tour of the new Our Climate, Our Future site. And then throughout the rest of the program, we'll be watching some short video clips from Our Climate, Our Future, taking questions for our guests and playing some climate trivia for a chance to win prizes. We have three American Express gift cards as prizes for you all today. Um, I also want to let you know that we have a couple of big surprises, uh, big prizes this semester. So any teacher who signs up for Our Climate, Our Future, or who's already signed up and watches Our Climate, Our Future with their class this semester, will be entered to win a $1,000 teacher scholarship. And for students who are tuning in, any young person who signs up to join ACE's Youth Action Network this semester, by texting in, will be entered to win a $5,000 college scholarship. So we'll have more details on that toward the end of the program. Okay, so now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our guests. First, we have Dr. Scott Denning. Scott is Professor of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University where he leads a group of grad students and scientists studying the global carbon cycle. He's the author of over 100 papers in the peer-reviewed climate literature and does a lot of work for NASA, NOAA, DOE, Department of Energy, and NSF. 
Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Reb. Hi, good to have you. Good to be here. So I got a couple of questions for you. First, um, what would you say is the coolest thing that you have contributed to climate science research? Well, my, my research is all about um, carbon and how uh, carbon from the atmosphere gets sucked into leaves and actually turns into plants, turns into living things. So it's the basis of all life on Earth. Um, and probably the coolest thing that we've discovered is that um, forests in uh, much of the world are actually putting on weight over time. Forests are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into new forests. And um, this is actually helping us out with climate change. It's, it's life itself is kind of on our side and helping, helping out in um, our quest to reduce carbon dioxide. That's awesome. And what's the weirdest question that you've ever gotten from a student? <laughs> um, well, that's a hard one because I get lots of great questions from people. Um, so kind of the weird thing is part of that same forest thing is, is if trees are sucking up all the CO2, how come we even have to worry about CO2, right? Okay, won't the trees just suck it all up? And so what people forget is that um, everything dies, actually. Bummer, like the trees grow and they, they suck all this carbon out, but then someday when the tree gets old and falls over, then the microbes eat the tree and, the, and it goes back up into the air. So there's kind of this weird thing about like life versus death and which one wins. and um, it, it's almost like kind of spooky, but, but it's a good question. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that the trees are doing all our work for us. Right. Totally. Okay, well, Scott, we are thrilled to have you. Next, I want to turn to ACE alum and climate leader extraordinaire Afsana Akhtar. Afsana grew up in Bangladesh and moved to the U.S. in 2006. She is a senior at Barnard College in New York studying environmental policy. And in addition to her work on climate, she is an avid photographer. Welcome, Afsana. Hi, thank you. Awesome to have you. So uh, tell me, what's a moment in your work on climate change that you are most proud of? Um, so participating in the People's Climate March um, and organizing it and like being a part of ACE and being a part of this movement where I, you know, shared my story, I wrote op-eds and I facilitated, um, you know, youth convergences to like mobilize the People's Climate March. That was like a really big um, moment for me and um, a great learning experience. Um, and just the march itself, being a part of like, you know, 400,000, over 400,000 people and marching in New York City and um, just feeling like it came together and people like me and uh, all these people who helped make this happen. And I felt the power of coalition of people coming together and fighting for something that they really care about. Um, and even though people came for all different reasons, like their main focus was climate justice. And, um, and I was really, I really felt connected to this really big movement. And yeah. That was amazing. That was the People's Climate March in 2015 in New York City, right? Um, yeah. And you led one of the events for young people right beforehand. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know you're a senior at Barnard now, um, and can you tell me what's the coolest class that you've taken at Barnard so far? Well, um, there's so many cool classes and electives that I get to take. Um, I would say one of the coolest classes that I took um, would have to be this class called Birds, Plants, and Land Use Dynamics. Um, it's an environmental science course, and we focused a lot on birds um, and, you know, ecology um, and the climate, past climate and present climate. Um, and we looked at how birds um, and plants are affected by climate change and how that in turn can affect us and other living things. Um, and the most exciting part of the course was that along with, um, you know, lectures, we also had a lot of like field trips where we got to le learn more about birds, identify birds and plants and like collect data and come into class and like analyze that data and like find new things about it. Um, so cool. We were able to, um, you know, like present our findings. We're able to um, do a lot of like journaling and drawings, which I really love. Um, and just, it was such an important, and then I also learned how birds and plants are a really important part of the ecosystem. Um, and like how we don't really talk about that very often, but that's really, really important. Um, and once that like a little part of the ecosystem is missing or is not maintained, um, how that can really affect the overall chain of things. So yeah, that's it. Well, cool. Congratulations on being so close to graduating. Thank you. It's exciting. 
Welcome. Um, and finally, I want to welcome Maroon 5 band member and ACE board member, Jesse Carmichael. Welcome, Jesse. Awesome to have you. Thanks. Jesse was born in Boulder, Colorado, and he is currently uh, lives in LA and has traveled extensively around the world for the last decade with his band, Maroon 5. He is a passionate environmentalist and lover of humanity and is excited about sharing his experience in the realms of creativity, design, and social media to help spread ACE's work. So Jesse, um, one question for you. What's a favorite memory of yours from high school? Uh, we had such a great time in high school and our band, I don't know if everybody knows, met in seventh grade basically. So we have been friends since we were 12 years old and we started playing music together um, around that time and started writing our own songs in ninth grade and booking shows all around the city here in LA and playing our high school dances and just really focusing on music. We had a great time. All our teachers were really supportive and here we are all these years later, you know, still going. And you were telling me it was kind of cool to see yourself go like this arc from, you know, playing at your high school dance to playing for Obama's um, inauguration ceremony. Yeah, we played at Al Gore's environmentally themed green ball party to put focus on environmental activism and stewardship. And it was an incredible night, the, you know, when Obama was inaugurated. It was a historic time and just to see our band um, come from our little high school and go to this place where we were interacting with people and we got to meet the president that night and it's just incredible. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, so if you could have any job other than being a band member of Maroon 5, uh, what would it be? I would and I probably will move into film scoring, helping to make music for films because I love film so much and I think maybe we'll talk about it later. There are some great documentaries that have incredible music. Uh, there was one called Chasing Ice, which I highly recommend to everyone. And a new film by that same film, uh, filmmaker, um, James Balog, is coming out soon called The Human Element. That's awesome. Cool. Well, Jesse, welcome. We're psyched to have you. So we will have plenty of time for a Q&A with all three of our guests later on in the program. Okay. So now I want to take you all on a short tour of ACE's climate education resource, Our Climate, Our Future, which we just released last month with all new videos and lesson plan content. So we're gonna be watching a few videos from Our Climate, Our Future uh, as we go through the program today. So you do have to log in to see much of the site and I'm currently logged in as an educator, as a teacher, so that I can show the teachers who are joining us today the educator resources section. Here we have um, a whole group of resources that each one of them, these are activities and lesson plans. They're all tagged under one of each of these five categories so that you can um, find one that you're looking for that's relevant to what you're teaching right now. You can also search for them. Uh, and if you're logged into the site as a student, you actually don't have access to these resources. So teachers, you don't have to worry that your students are gonna be able to see you know, the answer key or the teacher guide. But the student view to the site does have access to the student worksheets. Um, and then both students and teachers can access this take action page, which has specific actions that young people can take on climate change. One of my favorite uh, features of the site is this interactive map of climate stories from around the country. So you can see here we have stories from around the country. Here's one from North Carolina about coal ash. We are actively working on adding more stories to this map. And if you go down to the bottom, this is an opportunity for you to actually share your story with us. So you can tell us, you know, is climate change affecting you? Are you doing something to take action on climate change? Um, and if you fill that out, that's your chance for us to actually come and potentially make a video, our next film, about you. So now we are going to check out our first video of the program. 
This is chapter three, it's fossil fuels and CO2. And it gives us a preview of where fossil fuels came from and how we ended up relying on them for all of our energy needs. So let's check it out. To understand the connection between fossil fuels and climate change, say hello to my little friend. This is carbon dioxide, or CO2. Cute, right? <laughs> CO2 is made when you create a little love connection between one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. How do you do that? By burning carbon. We burn sugar made of carbon in our bodies, so we breathe out CO2. Burn a log, you get CO2. <laughs> See, carbon is a main ingredient in life. So when you burn things that were once alive, you pull out its carbon and create CO2 that floats up into the air. Coal, oil, and natural gas are called fossil fuels because they come from things that were alive long ago. Wait, hold on. So, so coal was once alive? We've got to go way back for this one. 300 million years ago. You ready? Back then, the earth was warm and swampy. There were all sorts of giant trees and plants, kinds you've never seen. These plants breathed in CO2 from the air and captured the carbon in their bodies, releasing oxygen back into the atmosphere. When they died, a whole lot of them got buried deep underground. Under heat and pressure, the dead plants got cooked over millions of years. They turned into black rocks called coal. Pretty much the same thing happened in the oceans, except instead of plants, it was tiny plankton, massive amounts of them. They got buried and compressed, and millions of years later, they turned into black ooze called oil and also pockets of gas called natural gas. All this trapped trillions of tons of carbon underground. Okay, fast forward to the 1800s. People found these fossil fuels and realized, whoa, when you burn this stuff, you get a huge amount of energy. By burning fossil fuels, we could, for the first time, power engines and machines, produce metals and concrete for building cities, run giant factories to make more stuff. Everything was faster and bigger. We started living large. Do you know that you can get more energy out of one gallon of gasoline than from 30 strong people working for a full day? All that energy made what we know as modern life possible. Fast forward to today and the fossil fuel party is still going. Look around and you'll see signs of fossil fuels everywhere. Flip a switch. The electricity comes from wires that go out of your home and run all the way to a power plant. That plant probably burns coal or natural gas. Going for a drive? Most cars are powered by gasoline, which comes from oil. Taking a shower? The water's hot thanks to a water heater that probably uses electricity or burns natural gas. Even your food has fossil fuels in it. It's grown with fertilizer made from natural gas and transported in big trucks running on, yep, oil. We live in a fossil fuel world. About 80% of all the energy we use right now comes from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have made life better for billions of people. But remember what we create when we burn them. Yep, CO2. We take all this carbon that's been buried underground for millions of years. Add oxygen and there goes the CO2, right up into our atmosphere, where it will stay for up to 100 years. And up there is where our search to understand climate change takes us next. All right. I love that clip because it really breaks down how fossil fuels were formed and how they ended up being used to make almost everything that we use today. So that's the fossil fuel side of the equation, but to make the connection between the CO2 that comes from fossil fuels and what's happening with climate change, um, Scott, I want to ask you to help us out here. 
So can you talk us through how adding more CO2 to our atmosphere ends up changing our climate? Sure. Can, can you see me on here? Yeah. Um, so, so all of the energy that warms our climate comes from the sun and uh, heat in minus heat out is change of heat. That's how, how the earth gets warmer and cooler. And so the difference between the incoming heat and the outgoing heat that adds to global warming, the heat has to get back out. But the world is floating in the vacuum of space. So there's really no way for it to get conducted out or convected out. It has to be radiated out to space. And to do that, it has to pass through the air. The air is made of molecules, and almost all the molecules in the air are just two atoms of the same thing. So there's oxygen molecules and there's nitrogen molecules, and that's 99% of the molecules. The molecules are transparent to the sunshine, um, and those two atom molecules are also transparent to the outgoing heat, the infrared heat that gets radiated out to space. But carbon dioxide is different. Carbon dioxide has three atoms instead of two. So I only got the two hands. Let's, let's just be carbon, oxygen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Along comes some uh, infrared radiation going back out to space. Oops, oh, Scott, I think we lost you. <laughs> All right, so what he was going to do, oh, I'm going to just start. Are you back? Problem? Hello? Hey, you were just about to do your, your dance. We lost your video, though. Oh, crap. I don't know how that happened. Um, here. It, All right, I... well, I, there, you're back. I'm back. Wow, that was weird. I'm not sure how that happened. Yeah, look oh, over to your right now. There, there you go. That's here. where we are. Hi. Okay, so um, so carbon dioxide. Okay, so now I'm a CO2, like your little drawing with the, with the line. And um, along comes infrared radiation, and it winds up um, sort of tickling those electrons that are the bond. It goes, woo, 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 woo. And that's actually transformed some of that infrared energy that was going up and turned it into the vibrational energy of that CO2 molecule. And there's more, because, because it's got three atoms, it can go Each one of these different ways of torquing this molecule around will wind up um, absorbing a different wavelength of infrared light. And that's what makes CO2 a greenhouse gas. It, it's not like because of greed or anything like that. It's, it's just because it's got three atoms and there's more ways for the radiation to interact with three atoms than, than two atoms. D does that explain it? Are you good with that? So awesome. I love that. And uh, if you all want to see more of how CO2 actually traps heat, if you check out the next chapter of Our Climate, Our Future, the CO2 molecules actually in that chapter do a little heat trapping dance that um, Scott and I spent lots of time basically choreographing so that they, the <laughs> CO2 molecules are actually matching Scott Denning's uh, own dance move. So Scott, that was awesome. Thank you. Cool. All right. So I think we are ready now for the first of our three trivia questions today. So here's how it's going to go. I will show the question on the screen and read the question and the answers out loud. And when I finish, but not before, then type the letter for, um, of the correct answer into the chat box. The winner is going to be randomly selected from the first 10 correct responses to win a $50 American Express gift card. OK. Uh, let me open my chat window here so I can see it. All right, here we go. Which of the following is not a major source of methane? Is it A, landfills, B, cars, C, cows, or D, fossil fuel mining and drilling? Go! So while we're waiting for some answers to come in in the chat, um, Afsana, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to give me the answer, okay? So you be thinking about what you think the answer is, but um, sit mm -hmm. tight on it for a minute. And Scott, you know, you were telling me earlier that methane works a little differently than CO2 in terms yeah, of how it heat. So can you can you talk about that? Sure. So so methane is natural gas, and methane is CH4. So um, you don't have my video now, right? 
Yeah, we do. Yep. You're looking. You do. Okay. Yeah, look right there. Right there. So, so CH4, instead of just having two things hanging off that um, carbon, now it's got four things. So I can't just use my hands. I got to use my feet too. So you can imagine now four bonds, right? One, two, three. You can hardly see my feet, but three, four. And you can go this way and this way and this way and this way. All these different ways to wiggle that bond all different ways to absorb infrared heat. So methane is a way more pop, powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So if you burn natural gas, you get CO2, but if you leak natural gas, if, if natural gas gets out of like pipelines and stuff or oil fields, then it goes up and it's way worse than CO2 for, for climate change. Right, right. awesome. Thanks, Scott. You bet. So Afsana, what would you wanna give a stab at the answer? What do you think? Um, sure. So I know that landfills do produce a lot of methane. Cars, cows yeah, are like actually a large source of the methane in the atmosphere. Indeed. So of course. So I would go with B, cars. I would say it does not produce as much methane. Yes, you are correct, Asana, because cars produce CO2. However, they do not produce methane. So in the US, most of our methane emissions actually come from drilling for natural gas. You can see the orange right here, or coal, uh, um, coal mining and oil drilling. Uh, landfills, animal agriculture, primarily cows, uh, make up the other biggest slices of our methane emissions. And we also know that methane is over 80 times as powerful as CO2 at trapping heat. Um, although there's far less of it in our atmosphere than CO2. Okay, so let me see who our winner is today. We actually have our winner from this one coming in from Facebook Live, and that's Maggie Sheeran from Facebook Live. So Maggie, congratulations. You are the winner of our first gift card today. Um, I think if you put your email in um, or reach out to us, we can get you that gift card. Hey, Rev, I wanted to add something to that. Yeah, Jesse. So in the movie that I just watched by James Balog called The Human Element, they had a wonderful story about how some coal miners who had previously been working in these giant um, strip mined mountains where they level off, they take the tops off of mountains so they can access the coal underground. And all of a sudden, with the rise of natural gas, a lot of coal-based, mining-based energy production has been going out of business. And so this company that used to be in coal teamed up with solar panel people because they had all this flat land. And so they created basically a giant solar panel farm to create energy in a totally clean and sustainable way. So I just wanted to add it in here that when we look at these charts and we see that natural gas is such a big piece of the pie, yeah, that's only because we haven't gotten creative enough as a whole society to find these new ways. And that's where you students come in, because as you grow up, you're going to you know, choose what profession you want to go into. And maybe some of you will be involved in energy production and you can start to think really creatively. So, yeah. Let's go. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So uh, Jesse, we are, I'd actually like to stick with you for a minute because um, we're gonna go ahead now and do some Q&A with our guests. So if you all have questions, go ahead, stick them into the chat. Um, but I'm gonna start off, Jesse, with one for you, which is uh, why are you committed to fighting climate change? I'm committed to fighting climate change because I think that I look back on the whole course of history that we know, and I see that humans have for a long time been fighting with each other over different opinions, and it's been thousands of years that we've been doing that. And I feel like we need more time to sort out what it is that's causing us to not get along with each other and to not live in more of a harmonious state with our world. And so Things like climate change related storms and pollution, making the air hard to breathe, are just gonna make it more difficult for us to focus on those core issues of how to enjoy life as a society better. It's gonna distract us, it's gonna 
cause there to be more wars. If, as droughts rise and water goes away, people will be fighting for resources. And all of these things are just things I don't want for the future. I'm gonna have a child soon myself, and I don't want them to grow up in a world that's filled with fear and dangerous environmental situations. And we've seen the way that the storms have been increasing and the wildfires have been increasing. So. To me, it's just a no brainer. It's like we're in a party and one of the rooms in the party is on fire. And so the question is, do we wanna just keep partying in the room that's not on fire yet, even though the fire is two doors down from us, or do we wanna to band together and say, look, we're all in this house together. If we want the party to keep going, we better stop and put out that fire and think about what caused it in the first place. So even if it's not our house yet, it's, it's gonna be eventually, right? Because yeah. we're all in it together. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I love that. Um, let's see. So we've got a bunch of questions coming in from the chat. Thanks, everyone. Um, here's one for Scott. Scott, how, uh, how are the different ways in which you can wiggle connected to retaining more heat? Okay. Can, can you hear me? I'm, yep. I'm, okay. I'm not muted. I'm good. I hear so, you. So, so how are the ways that we wiggle absorb heat? So the molecules themselves um, actually absorb the outgoing heat radiation. It's like heat rays, right? Like if you, you ever have one of those um, heat lamps above, like outside the shower in your bathroom, um, you can feel the heat coming off of that thing. It's heat radiation, it's heat rays, literally heat rays that are coming out from the earth and um, sending the heat out to space. And those um, heat rays, it's, it's photons, it's physics, you know, it's down at the molecular level, the electrons that bind the CO2 molecule together actually interact with that electromagnetic field as it's going out from the earth and woo, 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 they, they do this wiggly thing that actually absorbs the heat rays. So it's no longer going out. So the air is actually transparent to the part of the radiation that's coming in from the sun. I mean, you can tell air is transparent to visible light, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. But, but the air is opaque. The air, you can't get the heat rays to go through the air because of the CO2. And it's actually the molecular uh, interaction with the photons, with the waves of light that stop that heat radiation from getting back out from the Earth. And so the Earth accumulates the heat over time and it gets hotter and hotter. Got it, cool. I love these questions that are coming in. Um, here's another one that came in that uh, maybe Afsana, you might want to take first, but could be relevant for, for Scott or Jesse, you too. Um, oh. Yeah, so um, this is from Nina Corley. Hi, Nina. I'm so <laughs> glad you're here. Um, my students want to know who will be the first generation that will really be affected by this current trend in climate change. Um, I think Jesse answered uh, one of the questions similar to that, um, that, or maybe it was um, Scott, but um, that we are already feeling the, the effects of climate change and it's just over time, it's just getting more and more intense and more frequent. So um, in our generation, you know, will definitely feel the, one of like the first most intense impact and then as time, if we are not taking action to mitigate um, climate change and to reduce emission, it might um, get even worse. Yeah. Um, so. mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's sometimes a misconception that climate change will be felt in the future as opposed to, you know, people you know, are right, doing now. right, right. now. And yeah. it's not very like, you can't just reduce emission and like reduce carbon dioxide from the, from the atmosphere just, you know, as, as soon as you decide to do it, it takes a long time, so. Yeah, it takes time to get it out and it takes time for then that to translate into temperature as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Afsana. Okay, we will have more time for Q&A later on. And now we are going to watch another short clip from Our Climate, Our Future. is called, Is Climate Change a Hoax? And this video was really inspired by the increasing pushback against climate science and scientific integrity in general that we've been seeing over the last year or so. So, here we go. It's 
true that the climate has changed for natural reasons, mainly due to variations in the Earth's orbit. But usually it happens slowly over thousands of years, so animals and even early humans had a chance to evolve and adapt. But now we're seeing levels of CO2 pollution spike super fast over just a few decades. What? That's not normal. Nope. Can we adapt to such sudden changes? I don't know. I mean, how can billions of people pick up their cities and move to a safer spot? We're in deep trouble if this gets out of control. So yeah, the climate does change on its own, but what we're seeing today, this time it's on us humans. Then there are some people that say climate change isn't happening at all, that it's some giant conspiracy. Yeah, I've heard that. Many of these people know how to use YouTube. But very few of them are actual climate scientists. In fact, many aren't scientists at all. Ask climate scientists and 97% of them will tell you that it's real and humans are causing it. So, who are you going to believe? Say 9 out of 10 dentists tell you you need a root canal. But then a professional Minecraft player tells you you don't. You wouldn't want to believe the dentist, but you would, right? Right, right. <laughs> so why does it seem like we're not sure about climate change? Because a small number of people are screaming loudly, trying to make you believe that we just don't have enough information to be sure yet. Why would anyone want to do that? Well, some of them are too scared to face the truth. Others think caring about climate change is a political issue. But carbon dioxide isn't a Republican or a Democrat. It just traps heat. So Scott, I wanted to ask you, I know that you've encountered quite a few climate deniers in your work. So what's a tip that you have for someone who's not a climate scientist, who's trying to have a conversation about climate change uh, with someone who you know, doesn't think that humans are responsible? Yeah, I often get asked, you know, how, how do you know that it's us? You know, how, how come you, you think this isn't just happening on its own? And um, re really, I think there's kind of a, a misconception. When we say it's caused by humans, it's not like humans are like sending out heat rays into the universe or something. And it's not like me personally, my body causing climate change. It's the CO2. It's the carbon that we burn, just like you said in your video, that goes up in the atmosphere and traps all all this heat. So um, the, the reason why we know this, it, this is how it works is that we actually, 150 years ago, uh, somebody did this in a laboratory. They put CO2 in a tube and shined infrared heat like, rays through that tube and measured how much heat was absorbed by the CO2. And then, you know, that's 150 years ago. The, the measurements have gotten better and better and better. They've been done thousands of times all over the world. We don't just do it in labs. We do it outside. You can measure the, the heat absorbed by CO2 outside. You can measure it from balloons. You can measure it from airplanes. You can measure it from satellites. Pretty, pretty much, we have measured this like just thousands of times all over the place. There's no question that it's the absorption of heat by CO2 that's causing the warming. It's, it's directly measured in mm -hmm. our world. Mm hmm. Right. That's awesome. Thanks. I think there's some other questions coming in the chat about, you know, answers to people that are sort of One more thing I want to add to that. Totally. I see a comment here about, uh, is it even important to convince the deniers? And um, I just wanted to point out that it's um, to follow up with a comment in the video of why do some people shout so loud that climate change isn't real? A lot of them are paid people by people like the fossil fuel industry, the oil industry. So you have to look at the source of who provided the money for a document that you're reading or you're seeing online, because if it says paid for by the oil companies of the world, they have obviously a, a re An real to not want to have people switch to sustainable energy. They want to keep making money each quarter for their businesses. And so that's the kind of thinking that you as students have to get ready to like go a little deeper in and see, well, where's the source of this coming from? Yeah, Jesse, that's a great point. And it makes me, reminds me to mention that we're actually working on developing some lesson plans for teachers to help teach students how to evaluate 
the source of their information. So, you know, is it coming from a peer reviewed scientific journal or is it coming from, you know, a website or a industry funded something. So I think that's, that's a great point. Okay, so here we go. We have another trivia coming up, everybody. Okay, so this is our second trivia question of the program. Same thing as last time. I'll show the question and read it and the answer is allowed. When I'm done, then and only then you can go ahead and, and share your, enter your answer in the chat. And we're going to randomly pick one of the first 10 correct answers for another $50 American Express gift card. All right, here we go. How many homes and businesses are still without power in Puerto Rico after being hit by Hurricane Maria last fall? Is it A, 500, B, 5,000, C, 50,000, or D, 500,000? Okay, go. Go ahead and type your answer into the chat. Um, and, you know, Jesse, I wanted to ask you, I know that um, you guys have played in Puerto Rico before and you were actually involved in um, doing some relief work and donations for After Maria, is that right? Yeah, right after the terrible situation happened down there, there was a benefit concert and our band was unable to attend and actually perform, but we donated money to help with the relief efforts down there. And we hope awesome. it comes back online soon. It's, a, it's still a situation that's going on down there in terms of power outages, so. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this because, you know, it's, count, it's fallen off the news cycle a lot, but there are still um, a lot of people without power. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a few more seconds to, um, to get your answers into the chat. Looks like we've got a lot of them coming in. And, okay, Jesse, what do you think? Uh, how many homes and businesses are still without power? I don't know. I mean, it's been a while. How about 5,000? Uh, it is actually, C. it's 50,000. Yeah, 5% of Puerto Rico. Um, and it's actually the second worst blackout in history after Super Typhoon Haiyan, uh, which hit the Philippines in 2013. So uh, we do have a winner coming in, and that is Mrs. Santos. So Mrs. Santos's class, you guys are the winners. Congratulations. So I do want to share that uh, ACE has actually produced two video stories about young people in Puerto Rico and how the hurricane impacted them and their families. So we'll be putting the link to one of those videos into the chat. This is um, Amira, and she tells her story about how her family was affected by Hurricane Maria. Um, so we'll put that into the chat for you all to see. Uh, thank you, Sunny. Um, and then the second video we are actually releasing for the first time later today on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash ace space. So please go ahead and check it out there. We're excited to share Keishla's story with, with you as well. Okay, so now we have some time for some more Q&A with our guests. So let's see. Here's the first one from Canon. Um, Scott, maybe you want to take this one. Climate change has happened in the past. What's different this time? So yeah, climate change has happened in the past over you know geologic time, millions and millions of years. Climate has has gotten warmer and colder, warmer and colder. But all the times that has changed in the past, um, usually it takes millions of years for for climate to change. So even when it changes fast, like uh, there was this big ice age that twenty thousand years ago was super cold, um, and it warmed up a lot. And when the ice melted, the oceans came up hundreds of feet, and uh, it really sort of paved the way for, for civilization to get started. But that took a hundred centuries for that warming to happen. And that, that was a fast warming, a hundred centuries of warming. Um, we're, we're looking at, if we don't get um, really good policy in place in the next you know, 30 years, um, having that kind of amount of warming, like came, coming out of the Ice Age, but instead of 100 centuries, doing it in one century. So like 100 times faster. Mm -hmm. And that makes it so, uh, the climate changes out from under you so fast that you don't have time 
to adapt, right? Trees can't uh, grow in 100 years, and, and animals can't move to new places in 100 years, and especially cities, right? If, if Miami or New York or London um, is, is underwater, that's in 100 years, that's just too fast for people and animals and plants to adapt to. That's the big difference between modern climate change and the kind of change that we've had in the geologic past. Cool, thanks Scott. So here's one from Kelly Elementary School, um, and I'll leave this open to any of our guests. What do you think is the best way to fight climate change? Don't set carbon on fire. In your car. <laughs> <laughs> electricity to travel exactly which is a tough order because our our lives are already so woven into the idea of burning fossil fuels to get our energy so the the change i think has to happen in two directions it has to happen from the big side up on top from the policy makers who decide whether or not we're going to go along with things like the worldwide Paris Climate Change Agreement, which America recently pulled out of as the only nation in the entire world that's not participating in it. So students, I really want that to sink in for you guys, that for some reason, our president thinks it's okay to be the only country to not take part in this worldwide problem. Very disturbing. So we need from the bottom, you guys, and the population to decide what's really important and to vote accordingly so that people up here who make the policy are smart people who will help the entire world because we are all in this together. Absolutely. Afsana, anything to add there? No, that was great. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, like big changes have to come from our leaders. We need strong leaders in the country, um, at local level, at national level, at, you know, at global level. And um, like also like from within, like uh, us working in our community and like, you know, young people like you, like, um, like in the webinar, like they're learning and they're taking that knowledge and spreading it and like being in the know and like, like fighting for what you want and for what you want to see in your um, your country to happen, like for example, taking part in a Paris Climate Agreement and um, trying to go back into it and uh, joining that movement again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the Global Climate Action Summit happening in San Francisco in September. Yeah. I just want to add one more thing so that the awareness can spread about these things. Uh, students, there is an agency in our government called the um, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the head of it right now is a man named Scott Pruitt, who is a Republican who received hundreds of thousands of dollars from the oil industry when he was running for his office at the state level. And then when he was appointed, he is the one who helped influence our president's decision to leave the Paris Accord. And he sued the EPA before he was in somehow appointed to the head of it. So it just it's really mind blowing that there's an agency that's supposed to be safeguarding our environment and is run by somebody who doesn't believe in it. So these are the kind of crazy things that are going on right now that we need to make sure never happen again. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tessie. Thanks. It's, it's a tough situation. So I think we are, um, with those questions, starting to already move into our final section of the program. And that is climate solutions. And, you know, we know, I see every day in my work that young people are hungry for, to talk about the solutions to climate change. We know that you all are ready and willing to take action. So we're going to dive in now. And for us at ACE, it really starts by picking a DOT. And DOT stands for Do One Thing to Fight Climate Change. So in this next clip, we're going to hear from some young people about their dot, and then there will be 30 seconds in which it's your chance to pick your own dot and share it with ACE by texting it to us. So this is um, how you can um, win a chance to get that $5,000 college scholarship at the end of the semester, which we're giving to one person this semester who texts us their dot. So let's check it out. What's your dot? Let's check out a few to get you started. I was really surprised to find out that a lot 
A lot of greenhouse gases actually comes from meat production. Basically, the more meat we eat, the more pollution there is. So, I've decided to try to eat less meat in my life. I mean, you don't have to be a total vegetarian. You can go meatless once a week or even just do vegetarian lunches. Eating is something we do every day, so it really adds up and makes a difference. As a young person, I think social media is really important because it allows people to connect with people all around the world. I use social media to speak up about climate change. It's so easy to tap a button and share with my friends. It's my chance to speak out and let others know about the issues that I care about. I'm registering to vote to have my voice heard. Our representatives are elected by young people like me and it's important to let politicians know what young people think. We care about climate change and the environment. I definitely plan on voting on the next election so my voice can count. We have to get people talking about climate change. This is our future we're talking about. I talk to my mom, my sister, and my friends. I'm not an expert, but I can share my own story about why I care, and I can listen to theirs too. How are we going to fix climate change if we're not even talking about it? All right, now it's your turn. Pick your dot and tell us at ACE all about it. ACE helps young people like you who are ready to do something about climate change. So, are you in? Grab your phones right now. Text my dot to 64336. When you do, you'll share your dot with us and become a part of the ACE Youth Action Network, joining thousands of young people across the country who care about climate change. You'll also get a chance to win this. You got 30 seconds. You ready? Go! Okay, you guys, this is your chance. Do it. 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 Just do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Come on. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Just do it. Let's do it. Do it again. Time. All right, so I hope a lot of you had the chance there to text in your dot and share it with ACE. So when you do that, that's how you're entered to win this $5,000 college scholarship. And you'll also join ACE's Youth Action Network. And that's really where it all begins. That's how you will get connected to many more opportunities to take action. So Jesse and Afsan and Scott, um, I'd love to hear your dots. Jesse, what's yours? Well, I just saw a question come in that says, what can we do as young students to convince our, our politicians that climate change is real? And my dot right now is to just keep encouraging people to speak out with their voice to their representatives. And I do this myself as well. I call and leave a message um, for my representatives. And you can find these numbers online. Um, you can write an email to your representatives and we've had the opportunity to meet lots of politicians in our career and we talk to them and they say they read all of these emails, they get the messages from the message services if you leave it there because they want to be elected and so they want to know what people who are voting uh, care about because they know that if this large portion of the population, which is you young people coming up, is gonna vote a certain way, then they're gonna probably change their policies to remain elected. Okay, so there's your dot. Contact your elected official, tell them you care about climate change. Afsana, what's yours? So my do one thing that I'm doing right now or something that I would like to do? Uh, yeah, your current dot. What's your do okay. one thing right now? Uh, my current dot is, um, saving energy so if i am leaving my dorm i make sure that i unplug um you know my fan or my like my charger so that if i'm not using it that it's not being used um even if i'm not charging anything um it's still you know energy still coming in and it's being used so that's my yeah idea. so individual energy mm -hmm. saving behaviors too yeah. scott what about you well i'm lucky i i live in a city that um my my electric utility allows me to buy all of my electricity from wind and solar. 
So um, in my house, we, we only use um, solar and wind powered electricity, which is great that our city lets us do that. That's awesome. So we do have one more trivia left, but before we do that, um, Afsana, I know you actually, you have to run to class in a few minutes. So I wanted you before you go, just to share with us um, some of the cool research that you've been doing um, while you've been at Barnard. Yeah, so um, this past year, actually, um, I've been working on this project um, where I am looking at groundwater chemistry of, um, of wells, groundwater wells in Bangladesh. So um, typically, in, you know, Bangladesh has a really big problem um, with uh, arsenic in its drinking water, and um, it's causing a huge public health crisis and uh, one of the interventions was to switch to from shallow wells to deeper wells because shallow wells are typically higher in arsenic levels and deeper wells are not so much but um, there hasn't been a lot of um, research done to prove that or to check the future stability of these wells uh, just because they're safe right now doesn't mean they will be safe mm. so um, because so much is Bangladesh is, is either under below sea level or right at sea level. Yeah, okay. it's very like yellow. Yeah, the, so that's why it's also very prone to flooding also. Mm -hmm. um, so my goal was to um, research, uh, analyze the 700 wells from Bangladesh that our professor um, went actually to get these um, samples, water samples. And my goal is to analyze them and kind of evaluate whether these water sources were safe in terms of arsenic and other parameters, and also mm. to um, kind of evaluate whether these sources would be safe in the future as well. So yeah, it was. Um, yeah. That's great work. And what are you hoping to do when you, after you graduate? Um, I'm really interested in doing something uh, related to environmental education and public health, because I believe that, you know, um, in the power of education and that how, um, I witnessed how what like you know education can do to inform people and to make well informed decisions. Um, you know, for example, at ACE, um, I've also learned a lot at ACE, and I was able to teach my community about that. Um, and I think that something like public health, I I would love to learn and like teach others, um, um, so, you know, so that they know how to take action as well. Great. Thank you. And Asana, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. No problem. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, and I know we are, have only about five minutes left. So what we're going to do now is do one last trivia question. But then don't go away because Jesse actually has a special song to perform for us uh, that he'll take us out with right at the end. So Asana, I know you need a hop. So thanks so much. And everyone else, Let's get ready for our final trivia question. And here, Afsana, to send you out is a review when you spoke at the New York City Sustainability Summit a few years ago. Okay, everybody. So our last trivia question, same rules as before. I will read the question aloud, and when I finish, then go ahead and enter your answer in the chat. This one is for a $100 American Express gift card, so it's a tough one. Okay, here we go. These are the top four solar producing states in the US in 2016. Rank them in order of the most solar power produced. Go. Okay, while we're waiting for some of the answers to come in, um, Jesse and Scott, any, any thinking here? What would you pick as, uh, as the top one? Well, I know it's really sunny in Arizona, but I bet you California generates more uh, solar than, than Arizona just because they've taken it so seriously and, and gotten right, right on it. Mm -hmm. I like that thinking. Jesse, you're a fellow Californian. You're going to vote for California as a top pick? I agree with what Scott said, that Arizona and Nevada get so much sun. I would hope that there are some giant farms out there that are producing a lot, and that's certainly the future and it's going to be glorious so yeah it's surprising to me that north carolina is actually in this top four i mean i think that speaks to what dedicated state policy can do you know even if it's maybe not the sunniest or the biggest state in the country um, yeah. that to see them in there it's, it's pretty cool 
All right. So let's see. All right. I think we are getting close to getting a winner coming in. Give you guys a few more seconds. And while we're waiting, I do want to let you all know that this, uh, we are being recorded today. So you will be able to watch this later on. And uh, Jesse, do you want to tell us before we go through the, the answer here, what song you're going to play for us to take us out? I'm going to play a Beatles song called Revolution. Any particular reason why you picked that? I mean, that's what we need right now. We need a revolution in a lot of ways. We need a revolution in the the way we produce our energy and we also need a revolution inside our own minds and in terms of how we interact with each other and the thing that i wanted to say before we close is that sometimes it can feel like it is this us against them combative kind of warlike thing between people who care about the environment and people who don't and i think it's really helpful to try and just calmly you know deal with the fact that yes it's an outrage that things are being done the way they are but it's probably for some reason that makes sense to the people who are doing it so compassion is really important somebody mm -hmm. asked in the question why do politicians not choose to spend money on solar panels and it's probably because they have relationships already with oil companies and they're making money for their families and maybe they're greedy Maybe they've gone too far, but at the core of it is probably a person who wants to do right for themselves and their family. So it's about understanding that motivation and then being able to communicate with them nicely. Passionately, yeah. That, you know, maybe there's a better way that they can continue to make money if they were working in sustainable energies and everybody could be happy. So yeah, it's not human, like human. There are, you know, bad people to conquer out there. It's like we all have got to work together. <clears throat> Awesome. Okay, so we do have a winner, and the the answer here is the top solar states in 2016. And as you guys both guessed, California really is head and shoulders above the rest, producing over 18,000 megawatts in 2016. Second is actually North Carolina at 3,000, followed closely by Arizona, very closely close to 3,000 megawatts, and then Nevada coming in at number three at about 2,200 megawatts. And our winner is, I think this is the name of a school, AVNES206. So if that's your school, congratulations, you got it. Okay, so um, we just, we are to at the top of the hour, and Jesse, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now to, uh, to perform for us. So everyone, uh, Stay tuned, we'll stick around just for a sec at the end and I'm gonna give you some, some last instructions before we go out. Take it away, Jesse. Yeah, thank you guys for listening today and thank you for caring about the world and hopefully you can just in your own way spread the message about environmentalism to your family, to your friends and we can get through it all together. So this is a Beatles song called Revolution. <laughs> Revolution, well, you know, we all want to change the world. They tell me that it's evolution, well, you know, we all want to change the world. Talk about destruction. Don't you know that you can count me out? Don't you know it's gonna be alright? It's gonna be alright. It's gonna be alright. Solutions, well, you know, we'd all love to see your plan. You asked me for a contribution, well, you know, we're all doing what we can. But if you want money from people, then 
contact me. All I can tell you is, brother, you have to wait. Don't you know it's going to be all right? Stay positive. Jesse, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I want to say thank to you, to everybody who joined us today. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Teachers, that was great. Really it was fun. awesome. <laughs> Don't forget to sign up and watch Our Climate, Our Future with your students before the end of the semester for a chance to win a $1,000 teacher scholarship by the end of the semester. You can sign up at ourclimateourfuture.org. Uh, students, don't forget to text us, 64336, my dot, and everyone, go ahead and find us and like us on Facebook at Ace Space. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. You guys were awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.